good afternoon and happy Sabbath to all and welcome to our visitors. Let us have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I ask that you will remove me and that the words that I say, that they be not my own, but that they be your words from on high. Lord, make me into a human vessel. Pour out thy spirit that not only I hear and speak, but that your people will hear and that these words will be repeated and warnings given to, to all those who will listen, whether they will hear or forbear. And we'll be careful to give your name, praise, honor, and glory. For we ask these blessings and all others in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We, we pick up from where we were the last time that I spoke. And again, as I have warned and cautioned that the topic of modern spiritualism is a very vast topic and is so interesting because it does span, it does span from heaven when, when the enemy of souls began to try to take over. It's here now and it will continue until the enemy of souls is cast into the lake of fire. It's in every book of the Bible. Every book of the Bible, we see something about modern spiritualism. And the culmination, as we have studied, the culmination is found in the sixth plague. The culmination or the very height or the completion of the spirits of devils is, of course, in the sixth plague. So in other words, Mankind has been dealing with it. Well, God has been dealing with it since the enemy fell, and he will deal with it all the way until the sixth plague. And as it has continued to go on, and as we are in part 12, we need to understand that even though the name has been changed from spiritual, modern spiritualism, and now it's called spiritual formation, in fact, I was sent, in fact, I was sent a video not long ago. I was sent a video earlier this week, I believe, and the, um, the president was cautioning people not to get caught up in this particular thing, which is called spiritual formation. But, beloved, it's been around since 1985, and... For all intents and purposes, it was really the conference or the general conference had said it was against it was against their policy to even teach on the topic of hypnotism back in 1955. You'll find that in the fifth volume of um, the Bible commentary, but I'll speak about that as we move along further in this topic. Again, this topic will not this topic will, will not be over too soon. It's not going to be over, and as you will see, as we will talk about today, you will see how pervasive it has been from the very beginning of the nation of Israel all the way early on. So let us look at our first text of the day, and that is found in our text that we um, recited, and that is Revelation 16, 14 through 16. Revelation 16, 14 through 16, and the Bible says, For they... Speaking of these spirits that come to the, the beast and it comes to the dragon and it comes to the false prophet, it says, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he, and we'll dig deeper into this in a further topic, in this topic expanded, he, meaning the enemy, gathereth them together, gather the kings of the earth and the whole world. He is going to gather them under the influence of these spirits into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And so we know 
that as it applies to our church or the time of the beginning of our church, the earliest introduction of spiritualism, which at that time was known as mesmerism, and we know it was under the under the time when the Fox sisters were, the, the rappings were going on in 19, excuse me, 1858. So it was first called mesmerism, and then it was called hypnotism. But we know that whichever one you want to call it, it was first done, practiced on the angels in heaven. And we know that that was the reason why at first one half of the angels, but ultimately one third of the angels sided with the enemy because they were under hypnotism. I go back and I say, what chance do we have against it? And after it was in heaven, then it was in the garden. And that was how the enemy convinced Eve to eat the fruit. She, he had her under hypnotism because God never said you shouldn't touch it. He convinced her to touch it. And that was, see, we look at things today such as neuro-linguistic programming and we say, oh, that's so advanced. But it was done back there. It was just the voice. It was just him saying, yea, has God said that you shall not die? So they talk as if neuro-linguistic programming is this new thing. It's really what the enemy has been doing. It's just that now that we see it more often or we see that it's happening, more people are talking about it. But it's, it was done back there. If he did it back there, then doing it now is no big deal. And then we know that not long after the flood, not long after the flood, those who followed Nimrod were under it as well. Mm -hmm. On and on and on and on and on. He keeps doing the thing. So Paul warns us, Paul warns us in 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 8, 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 8. Paul, Paul warns us that in these days, in the, in the last days, in the very last days, perilous times shall come. Nothing is going to be able to be compared. Perilous time, there will be nothing to compare to these times. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, we're going to take 1 and then we'll take 8. He says, this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, he goes through this list of all the things that we can expect, or the reality of it is the list of things that are happening right now. All the things that he talks about are happening right now, but then... He gets down to verse 8, and he says, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, those were the two magicians who worked for Pharaoh at the time, and they were the ones who were duplicating the first three of the ten plagues that Moses exerted on Egypt. And that, their names were Janus and Jambres. They withstood Moses. So do these, speaking of those who are in these perilous times that Paul talks about, so do these also resist what? The truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Reprobate. What does it mean to be reprobate? It means to be a person who has no principles. When you look at an idea, an idea we'll talk about a little later. When you look at an idea, the very foundation of an idea is the principle. That's the foundation, right? So a person who is reprobate is a person that has no foundation. They have no basis. In other words, they'll go whatever way, whatever works. That's, you know, that's kind of associated with filthy lucre if the money is right. And if the money is righter, well, this is how a uh, reprobate mind works. In other words, what's best for the time or for the day. So Paul warns us that in the last days, there are people strongly willing to withstand the truth, just as the, the magicians did in Pharaoh's court. The magicians had seen several manifestations that God was with Moses, but they withstood because even after the first three, they still tried. And then when the, some of those plagues fell on them, they said, this must be the finger of God. But yes, they did. It's in the Bible. They said, this must be the finger of God. And they tried to warn Pharaoh, but Pharaoh was so dug in that it was nothing that they can do. They, they withstood Moses nonetheless. And that is because, beloved, that is because then and now, 
The only thing that stands against the truth is Satan and his minions. If you have the truth and someone standing against you, guess what? That's the enemy of souls. Well, they're working for the enemies of soul. That's why Paul says perilous times. When you have the truth, whatever stands against the truth is, is against God. They're not standing against you. They're standing against God. You just unfortunately or fortunately are an agent of God. But you as an agent of God are standing against an agent of the enemy. Can't put it any plainer than that. And it's a spirit that will be here until those who love not the truth are cast into the lake of fire. Again, until those who love not the truth, it's going to be here until they are cast into the lake of fire. So don't think it's going to get easier. In fact, it's going to get worse. That's why our opening text talk about these are the spirits of devils that go to the kings of the earth. They will have been to their height. They make it to their height of power in the sixth plague. So by the sixth plague, the only people that are going to be here are the 144,000 and the wicked. Shows you how long it's going to be here. And so I want you to understand. I want us all to get a clear understanding of how important it is for us to be on our guard every idea, every thought of the day. Not every minute, not every second, not every hour, but every thought must be on God. We have to subject ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so let us go and see how quickly when God had established Israel as a nation that the enemy went after them. Let us look in 1 Samuel 15 and 23. 1 Samuel 15 and 23. Now as you turn to 1 Samuel 15 and 23, this is Saul's Second sin in being disobedient to God. This is his second sin in being disobedient to God. The first sin was back in 1 Samuel 13, where, Sam, where Saul was supposed to wait seven days for Samuel. But instead, he, he hastened to perform, the, the, as he called it, the burnt sacrifices before Samuel arrived. And in short order, after the first sin, the Lord had told Samuel to tell Saul that the kingdom would not stay with his family because God could see in Saul that there was this disobedient spirit that even being the king and getting direct message from God, he was going to do what he wanted to do. And so when we look at 1 Samuel 15, 1 Samuel 15, Samuel has told, God, told Saul as a result of his dereliction of duty, because that's just what it was. It was dereliction of duty. He had a duty to do, but he did what he wanted to do. And because of this dereliction of duty, this is the second time, First Samuel 15, 23, the Bible says that Samuel tells Saul, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. A rebellious spirit. God says is as a sin of witchcraft because that's where rebellion started in heaven. And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So stubbornness is looked, is looked at as a sin and it's looked at as an idolatry. Why is, stub why is stubbornness looked at as a sin and idolatry? Because we put ourselves in the place of God. We make ourselves our own idol or our own God. We talked about that this morning, the first commandment. And then Samuel tells Saul, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected thee from being king. At first he told him in 13 that God is going to remove any further king from your family of being the king. No one else will be a king. But then after the second one, God told Samuel to tell Saul, I have to even remove you. But he's also telling him by these words, rebellion, which is what Saul was at, was showing, he was saying that you need to put this in check, Saul, because your next step from rebellion is witchcraft. So if you're rebellious, I, God can see way down the road further than us, right? So God is saying to Saul, I see where you're going. It is rebellion. Your next step is witchcraft. Now we know the end of Saul, his, the worst thing he did was the witch of end. God saw it before he did it and was warning him. And even with all the warnings, beloved, 
What did Saul tell the people to do? Find me a woman with a familiar spirit. Mercy. And, and so here's the problem. Here's the problem with us. And I point to myself at first. We often look at King Saul and think about how he rebelled against God. But we forget that the people had demanded a king and after Samuel had told them all the unsavory things that a king would do to them and their families and their rebellious spirit and the people's rebellious spirit, they said, we're going to have a king. Stop running. All the lists, he went down all the lists. He said, your daughters are going to have to cook for the king. Your sons are going to have to go to war for the king. And they said, yeah, we're going to have a king. So a rebellious king was a result of a rebellious people rebelling against God. And beloved, it is this spirit that has followed the people of God throughout history. Whether it was literal Israel, the churches of the Protestant Reformation, or the remnant church. It's always been there because Satan knows what to put in front of the people. Let's, let's look back. Turn back, we're staying in 1 Samuel, turn back with me to 1 Samuel 8, 1 Samuel 8 and 7 through 9. As you're turning, the backdrop is the people have, they, they, they really were unhappy with what happened with Samuel's sons. And they were also looking around and seeing the things that were going on with all the heathen nations. And they had, they had tried to have some skirmishes with the other heathen nations and, and they kind of got beat up. So because they got beat up and because of Samuel's sons and a few other things, the people felt that if they had a king, they wouldn't have to worry about going to battle and, and losing. I don't know how they thought that, but that's the truth. And so we look in 1 Samuel and look at how this all comes to fruition, beloved. We see in 1 Samuel 8, 7 through 9, the Bible says, and the Lord said unto Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. So let me keep reading, then I'll go back. Now, therefore, hearken unto their voice, how be it yet protest solemnly unto them and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. So we went forward and we came back, okay? And so God is telling, first and, all, first and foremost, God is telling Samuel, hear what they say. I've been hearing it. Now you hear what they say. Hear what the people say and understand that it's not you, it's me. Don't take it personal. Amen. Don't take it personal, Samuel, because this is what I've been dealing with since 1592 B.C. Okay? 1592 B.C. Right around here is about 740, 700, and about, 900, about 800 B.C. So God is saying, I've been dealing with this for 700 years. They came out of Egypt in 1592, okay? So give or take, you look and you count the different years with the judges and all, by the time Solomon became king, it was around about a little bit, about 800 and 840, 50 BC. So if you do the math, you, you figure it out because remember, um, 677 was when the first kingdom was, um, the northern kingdom was dispersed. Okay, so he continues and he says, According to all the works that, they, that, that, they, that which they have done, he said, everything that I've seen from the time that they came out has already shown me that they are always going to forsake me and go to other gods. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, I said that this, is not, this wasn't limited to Israel and it wasn't limited to the Protestant Reformation. It was everybody who claimed to serve, to serve God. We're getting somewhere here. But then he says, no matter what, he said, listen to their voice. He said, listen to their voice. He said, but I want you to protest against what they're doing and solemnity. Solemnly tell them what's getting ready to happen. 
Because once you go down this road, God says, you can't turn around and say, we don't want a king anymore. Once you have it, fate complete. Right? And he, so Samuel explains it, and that's what took us to when they say, well, yeah, we're going to have a king. Now watch how the spirit of prophecy, how the prophet tells us, or how she explains it. She says, speaking of Samuel, and you would, we would have to wonder, say, why, why would God do this? This is in Patriots and Prophets, page 605. The Bible says the prophet, excuse me, the, spirit, the prophet says, the prophet was reproved for grieving at the conduct of the people toward himself as an, ind as an individual. God says, you're taking my work personally. This isn't your work, this is my, my work. They had not manifested disrespect for him, but for the authority of God who had appointed the rulers of his people. So in other words, when we question God appointing rulers, we think we know more than God. That's why I caution people about jealousy. If, Pastor, if God has given Pastor Brown something or God has given Raymond something, that's for Raymond, that's for Pastor Brown. If I look at it and say, well, why didn't he give it to me? Oh, like I know what God knows? See, when God gives someone something to do, that's because God says Brown is at a point in his life where I can give it to him. Anthony, you're not. And so what God is saying to Samuel is, you don't, you, you don't understand that it's not about you, it's about me and how they feel about, oops, how they feel about God. So when God appoints rulers, it's not for us to, to, to bicker about or debate about or to say, well, I wouldn't do that if I were him. Because, no, you're not, we're not him. Those who despise and reject the faithful servant of God show contempt, not merely for the man, but for the master who sent him. It is God's words, his reproofs and counsel that are set at naught. It is his authority that is rejected. So we know that Samuel presented to the people all the things that a king would do. And just as if the people never heard a word, they had never heard a word, they said, no, no, we, no we're going to have a king. We're going to have a king. The prophet goes on and she says, the Lord had through his prophets foretold that Israel would be governed by a king. Remember Moses told him this is what you're going to do. But it does not follow that this form of government was best for them or according to his will. He permitted the people to follow their own choice because they refused to be guided by his counsel. This is a wonderful wonderful lesson here, brothers and sisters, because we're going to see how this thing of spiritualism is really rising to the, it's like um, foam on a, a, a soda or anything that can, any kind of liquid thing that could have foam. We're seeing the foam rise to the top. It does not follow that this form of government was best for them or according to his will. He permitted the people to follow their own choice because they refused to be guided by his counsel. Hosea declares that God gave them a king in his anger, not because he wanted to. When men choose to have their own way without seeking counsel from God or in opposition to his revealed will, he often grants them their desires. In order that through, their, through the bitter experience that follows they may be led to realize their folly and to repent of their sins. So God lets us make, if we want something bad enough, that's not good for us. God allows us to have it. And then when it goes awry, God says, okay, now you're going to come to me. But unfortunately, more, more often than not, we, we want to keep going down that road. But God is trying to teach us and show us what we support what we should do. Human pride, pride before the fall, and wisdom will prove a dangerous guide. That's a good little rhyme. Human pride and wisdom will prove a dangerous guide. That which the heart desires contrary to the will of God will in the end be found a curse rather than a blessing. And so what they wanted, the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel, 819, and here's where our story starts to take the twist. 
1 Samuel 8 and 19. This is not what God wanted, but this is what the people demanded. And you there say amen. amen. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 8, 19, nevertheless, after all the warnings, if you, if you read from what I showed you in 1 Samuel 8 and 3, all the way down to 19, 16 verses of what a king was going to do. After those 16 verses, the people and it was told, nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, which was the voice of God. And they said, nay, but we will have a king over us. We're going to have a king. Even if you don't give us one now, we're going to have a king. Now, watch this. A rebellious people deserve a rebellious leader. A rebellious people deserve a, a rebellious leader, and they got a rebellious leader in the person of Saul. They, wanted, they were rebellious. And what they deserved was a rebellious leader so God could show them what it meant in the rebellion by giving them a, God, a, a, a king that in his first, before long, what did Saul do? He rebelled against God three times. The third time was going to the witch of Endor. Mm -hmm. Beloved, this is the principle as to why it became easy then. And it is even easier now for people to accept rebellious leaders. It is because they, people, are rebellious in the heart. And for millennium, the Holy Spirit has been keeping that re rebellion in check, hidden in the hearts, as it were. In other words, the reason we haven't seen the rebellion to the level it could be is because the Holy Spirit has been keeping that rebellion in check. And now the leaders of the world are given license to rebellion by their actions. And as a result, the people are showing what? Their rebellion. The rebellious people who were at one time kept in check are now coming out of the woodwork. Is this not true? Now, now when, as I've been studying this out, beloved, as I've been studying this out, I said, this is amazing because we know the Holy Spirit has been removing itself, withdrawing itself from the earth, right? And in its withdrawal, the manifestation of the evilness that is in people's hearts is getting worse and worse and worse. And so when we look at Revelation, and don't turn there yet, when we look at Revelation 16, these are the spirits of devils that go to the kings of the earth and to the whole world. And so... The hearts are being, have been primed, and the leaders are saying, I can be rebellious. Someone asked this morning, why is it that a president can write an executive order? And they're doing it for whatever they want to. Because they can't get Congress to do what they want, and they can't get the Supreme Court to do what they want, so they write an executive order. That's rebellion. Is that not rebellion? So we're seeing, and so when the people see the presidents or the senators or the House of Representative members do this, then they think that it's, it's okay. All bets are off. The restraints are being removed. And, that's because, and, and at this time that we're in, beloved, the Holy Spirit is still restraining what happens when it removes. It is the spirits of devils moving more strongly than ever before, but not as strong as they're going to be. These spirits are unleashing human passions and evil is coming from everywhere. And, and, and wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not just the political leaders. Also the professed spiritual leaders as well. Turn with me to Hosea 4, 6 through 9. Now remember, the leaders, the leaders are doing only that which is also in the hearts of the people, right? So watch what Hosea said. Well, I've always read the earlier parts of this, this, this chain of scripture, but when I got down to verse 9, I said, wait a minute. We, sometimes we hear parts of scriptures and we like that part and we leave out other parts, but watch what Hosea tells us 
in chapter 4, verses 69. He says, my people, and you all know this, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt not be no priest to me. Seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy ch children. We, we all know that. We've all heard that before, right? We've all read it. But then he goes a little further. Hosea goes a little further and says, as they were increased, speaking of the people, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into shame. Another word for, another word for shame is also reprobate as well. Okay? They eat up the sin of my people and they set their heart on their iniquity. Verse 9. And there shall be like people, like priests. Like people, like priests. What you see happening at the priest is no different than what the people are doing. The priests are giving the people just what they want. And so if a church is not learning, it's because the people have not demanded by their footsteps and by their tithe by saying, either you teach or I'm going somewhere else. And there shall be like people, like priests. And I will punish them for their ways and reward them their doings. What's in the heart of the people? The leaders are going to find a way to milk out. And if the people say, we don't like that, and the people turn 180 degrees, guess what the leaders are going to do? They say, we've got to change our story because the people aren't going for this. And so what's in the hearts of the people, what has always been is what the leaders have learned how to capitalize on. And so as the Holy Spirit is being removed, as we get closer and closer and closer to the end, and we are st we're standing on the very precipice of it, we can expect that these spirits of devils are having their heyday. So what we saw in, in, the, in terms of Saul, the people were surprised, but it wasn't something that made them upset with Saul. The prophet tells us the following in Desire of Ages, page 306. Desire of Ages, page 306. She says, hearts that respond to the influence of the Holy Spirit are the channels through which God's blessings flow. Hearts that respond, okay, to the influence of the Holy Spirit are the channels through which God's blessings flow. So if they're not responding to the influence of the Holy Spirit, then what comes through their hearts? The opposite of God's blessings. Were those who serve God removed from the earth, you and I, were those who serve God removed from the earth and his spirit withdrawn from among men, this world would be left to desolation and destruction. The fruit of Satan's dominion. Though the wicked know it not, they owe even the blessings of this life to the presence in the world of God's people whom they despise and oppress. Desire of Ages, page 306. And so as we get closer to this, remember we talked earlier this morning, God doesn't do things in an instant. He does it through a process and he allows the progression of things to basically say, okay, there's no turning back. And so as we're watching this progression, as we're getting towards the time when Michael stands up, God says, I'm showing you as many things so that you will understand that once Jesus stands up, he's not sitting back down again. Amen. She says in Testimonies to the Churches, Volume 1, page 204, when Jesus leaves the most, holy, the most holy, his restraining spirit is withdrawn from what? Ruler and people. They are left to, control, to the control of evil angels. Then such laws will be made by the counsel and direction of Satan that unless time should be very short, no flesh could be saved. There will be no restraining power on the hearts of those people, but it was already, it's, it's there. It's in their hearts, but the Holy Spirit is still those four angels. Remember those four angels standing on the, on the four corners of the earth. Okay? That's the winds of strife they're holding back. Political, military, economical, environmental. All those things will be unleashed 
And the only reason why they're not unleashed is because you and I are still here. And God says, I still got some work for you and I, for you to do. Go back to Samuel. Go back to 1 Samuel. You probably didn't turn your pages because we didn't, we didn't, we didn't go anywhere further in the scripture. So let's go back to 1 Samuel and see if what I'm saying, am I just, am I uh, coming up with a theory? Or am I, can I prove this? 1 Samuel 16, 23. You know the story. Um, Saul sent for David because Saul was having a time with evil spirits. Hello? <laughs> First Samuel 16 and 23, the Bible says, and it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul. Now, this is, this is, this is after the first two sins. Bless me. This was after the first two sins. Now we're going towards the third sin, which is the which of Endor. Saul is now totally, well, not totally, but to a great degree, under the evil spirits. And he knows that there's one thing that could possibly soothe this. They say music soothes the savage beast. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, 23, and it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well and the evil spirit departed from him. Now many people will say that, oh, this goes to prove that God sends evil spirits. No, all God had to do was remove his protection from Saul and by default, Satan came in. And whatever was in Saul's heart just was manifested more. It just was revealed more. So we can see that in these last days, in these last days, there's going to be a clearly dividing, dividing line between those who are obedient to God's word and those who are not. Those who have righteousness or have a desire to have righteousness in their heart and those who just feel that I'll get to it when I get to it. But other worlds are looking at the, at, at, the, at the earth and they're looking and watching what we're doing and they know that it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way. In fact, the, the prophet was taken into vision to see other, other worlds and the other worlds know that we, don't, we didn't have to be this way. Christian experience and teachings, page 97. Christian experience and teachings. The Bible, I mean, the prophet says, the Lord has given me a view of other worlds. Wings were given me and an angel attended me from the city to a place that was bright and glorious. The grass of the place was living green and the birds there warbled a sweet song. The inhabitants of the place were of all sizes. They were noble, majestic, and lovely. They bore the express image of Jesus. That should make you, that should give you goosebumps. They bore the express image of Jesus. In other words, it can be done. Other beings have the express image of Jesus on them. It can be done. And their countenances beamed with holy joy, expressive of the freedom and happiness of the place. I asked one of them why they were so much more lovely than those on the earth. She had been, she didn't say one world. Look at the first sentence. The Lord has given me a view of other worlds. Okay. And she says they were noble majestic. So she's not talking about just one planet. She's not talking about just one creature. She's talking about wherever she went. The reply was, we have lived in what? Strict obedience to the commandments of God. It can be done. It can be done. And then they say, and have not fallen by disobedience like those on earth. It can be done. It can be done. We don't have to fall under these delusions. And so let's go ahead and move forward now to see how this, the basis of this really, really finds itself. Turn with me to the New Testament, to the book of Luke, to the book of Luke, Luke 6, 45, Luke 6, 45. And you have it say amen. amen. All right. The Bible tells us this is Jesus talking and he says a good man 
Out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So in other words, whatever is abundantly in the heart, guess what? It's going to come out. Now we can keep it in check for a while, but, it, but when the Holy Spirit is withdrawn, you will, we will not be able to keep it in check. So it makes sense now, beloved, to be in the habit to, to, for it to be our very basis, our principle for speaking only good things. Because that is what will alter, because you know, and it's not what, it's not what, what does it say? It's not what comes down, goes down, it's what comes out. Because it's not what goes down that determines what's, us, what's in us, it's what comes up that says, oh, that's what's in you. And so this principle, this principle of what's in the heart and how it comes out, all has to do with who is controlling our minds. And that's what the enemy started in heaven. He started this process of trying to control the minds of any and everyone who was following God. It's a, it, this is a principle that we need to understand. It's all about mind control. Who do we yield ourselves servants to obey? Right? But that very, but mind control or how Satan tried to have an effect on the controlling of the mind comes down to what is the policy. And the policy that Satan used in heaven, the, spot, the prophet told us, is hypnotism. He used hypnotism in heaven. The angels were hypnotized. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, but you will see in the spirit of prophecy, Sister White tells us in testimonies to the minister, she said, I am afraid of the science that Satan used in heaven and then he used on our first parents. She said the science of hypnotism. So his policy is hypnotism. Everything evolves around hypnotism. Now, how does he use hypnotism or how does he push hypnotism to work on each and every one of us? And that is called spiritualism. That is, that is it in action. That is boots on the ground. That is what he uses to control the minds and he uses hypnotism and nowadays they call it spiritualism. But they don't really call it spiritualism. It was taken over eventually, beloved. It was taken over by Loyola. You know who Loyola is, right? The Jesuits. But you know, the Seventh-day Adventist church would never allow someone to come into the church and say, we're going to teach spiritual exercises. So what they did was they changed the name to spiritual formation. Because the enemy knows, as long as I can get people to cherish their passions, Ultimately, I can cause those passions to bring them down. Mm -hmm. yes. And when the time comes, and when those, because he, all he's trying to do is hold those in check who will not do what God says do. He wants to hold them in check. Mm -hmm. Enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy your passions. Mm -hmm. And then when the, when the angels release, those passions come out. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a friend. I was talking to a friend the other day. And he said, I, he said, I'm seeing it. He said, I'm seeing how people are coming out of the woodwork with this evil. And that is still not with the angels releasing. We are on, we are at the tip of the iceberg, Pastor Brown. The tip of the iceberg, beloved. And so as we recap that section, we still got, I still got 15 minutes, so don't rush me out of here. So let's, re, let's recap because because this is Satan's religions we're dealing with right here. This is actually Satan. Let me make it clear to you. When God told Adam and Eve that in the day they eat thereof, they shall surely die, right? Sin and live, excuse me, sin and die, right? Sin and die, don't sin and live. Satan flipped it around and said, sin and live. If you sin, you will live because God knows in the day that you eat, eat thereof, you will be as, king, as, as gods, right? Knowing good and evil. And a God doesn't die. And so Satan introduces this religion, which is spiritualism, and he uses hypnotism to, enter, to bring it in. And so what ends up happening is his science, his religion, or his government is based on 
mind control. That's the foundation of his government, mind control. Now, that's the principle. A principle is the, is the basis of it. How does he make this happen? Through a policy called hypnotism. He tr Eve, the prophet says that it worked, that that's what he used on Eve. Just all you do in your, in your spirit of prophecy um, app, just type in hypnotism. You will see it. Okay, so he uses, he, that, that's how, that's, everything is based on him using some form or fashion of hypnotism. The practice today, the practice today is in spiritualism or modern spiritualism or spiritual formation or spiritual exercises. He can dress it up any kind of way he wants. Excuse me. He can dress it up any kind of way he wants, but it is spiritualism. And the prophet tells us this in spiritual gifts. The prophet tells us this in spiritual gifts under the title of hypnotism. She says, the sciences of phrenology, psychology, and mesmerism have been the channel through which Satan has come more directly to this generation and wrought with that power which was to characterize his work near the close of probation. You hear that? This would be one of the main attributes of what's going on as we get closer to the close of probation. More different ways to be hypnotized. Think it not true? Do like I do. All cell phones now tell you how much time you're spending on it. At the beginning of the new week, it tells you how much time you're spending on it. Yeah, they do. You can, you can just tell, you say, how much time am I spending on it? And see how much time you're spending on your cell phone. I see people shaking their heads like, yes, I, I, that's right. And all you have to do, right. So what happens is, if you, because you get on it for one thing. Say you say, I'm not going to get entrapped by this, this cell phone. I'm just going to look at the weather. And you look at the weather, and the next thing you know, you go to something else. And before you know it, half an hour, 45 minutes. In that time frame, you go back to it two or three hours later. What is drawing us to that? Oh, if you understood the technology that's behind it. Oh, if you understood the person who invented the technology behind cell phones. He hung out with the Fox sisters. The very man who, hung, who, who, invented the back, who invented the technology for television. Robert Crooks. He hung out with the Fox sisters. Sister White says that this would characterize Satan's work near the close of probation. As I use these last 12 minutes, I want you to understand because we need to be fortified, right? We need to be fortified. And the disciples were fortified. They were fortified at the moment that they said, you are Jesus, the son of the living God. They were fortified. They had gotten the fortification, right? We talked about that last time. I want to bring some more clarity as to why they tripped up. Does that make sense? Because remember, they were told that they were told that they were to cast out demons and all these things, raise the dead, etc. Right? And they did it. But then, after they acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus goes to the Mount of Transfiguration. They were supposed to be down at the foot of the mountain praying, and when the man came with the son, they were supposed to be able to expel the demon, right? But they couldn't do it. We understand that, right? So now let's, I want to reinvestigate this in the last 11 minutes that I have. The clock is telling me I'm at 49 minutes, and I'm going to, I'm going to try to stay within an hour. So let's go and go back to Luke 10, 17 through 20 for yours and mine, yours and my um, um, becoming more settled in this understanding of, of what God wants to give us. Now, I'm going to be quoting, and I'm not sure if you're familiar, if you do have uh, the CD-ROM, you are familiar with Matthew Henry's commentary, okay? And Matthew Henry was one of the commentaries. He was a Presbyterian who many of the pioneers quoted from. So I feel that I have license to show some of his quotes. And I, I want to show you this as it relates to Luke 10 and 17 
and how we need to be careful with this spiritualism thing because it's going to come after God's people. I forgot everybody else. Who do I go after? Okay, so we quote, we look at Luke 10, 17 through 20, and the Bible says, and the 70, remember, Christ gave power to, the, to, to raise the dead and to cast out unclean spirits to the disciples and then also to the 70 later. It says, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils, unclean spirits, are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice, not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I'm going to break this down and we'll close out after this so we understand what we are up against, what's in the hearts of people, and how we can be careful not to let these things happen to us. Okay, so let's look at the scripture first. The 70 come back, and they are so successful in Jesus' name that they tell Jesus that the, that the demons are subject to us through your name. Okay, that shows you the power of his name. Amen. That's the power of his name. Okay? And Jesus responds to them, letting him know that he saw Satan. I saw Satan fall from heaven. And there are two um, potential um, meanings to this, and we're going to look at both of them in this last few moments. And then he tells them, after they had done this, after they had done this, after they said they were successful at doing this, remember we talked about earlier today that as prophecy is revealed, we have a work to do. Amen. So they did what Jesus sent them out to do. And they came back and reported to Jesus that we were successful in your name. Jesus says, A plus on your paper, right? Then what Jesus does is he says, look in verse 19. Yeah, verse 19, he says, behold. Now look, he, they were successful. But then he says, behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. In other words, you did what I told you to do. I'm expanding your power. You have already seen what working in my name can do. Now I'm going to expand what I have given you and give you the power to stamp on serpents. Amen. And what does he go? He goes further and says, and over all the power of the enemy. Now that's a, that's a, that's a, tall, that's a tall promise. He doesn't say just some of the power. He says, I'm going to give you power over all the power. Of, can Jesus lie? So if he says, I'm giving you power over all the power of the enemy, what is he telling you and I? That's a lot of power he's willing to trust us with, but we have to, we have to exercise power in the little things before he can give us the greater things. Amen. So Matthew Henry explains it this way, and this is how I came to understand this. I'm no smarter than anyone else. Matthew Henry says this in volume five on page 683. What account they gave him of the success of their expedition. They returned again with joy, not complaining of the fatigue of their journeys, nor of the opposition and discouragement they met with, but rejoicing in their success, especially in casting out unclean spirits. Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. So only the healing of the sick was mentioned in their commission, Luke 10, 19, yet no doubt the casting out of devils was included. And in this, they had wonderful success. Note, all our victories over Satan are obtained by power derived from Jesus. Amen. See, the same power the Jews coming out of Israel could have had, but they were more interested in what was going on around them with the other heathen nations. They could have had the same power. It's not just, it wasn't just in the New Testament that we hear that the demons were doing what they were doing. It was in the Old Testament as well. Balaam was, under, Balaam was a false prophet. He was under an evil, an evil spirit. He continues and says, We must in his name enter the list with our spiritual enemies. And whatever advantages we gain, he must have all the praise if the work be done in his name. The honor is due to his name. So no matter what success we get, it's not our success, it's his success. They entertain 
excuse me, those who came back, the 70 who came back, they entertained themselves with the comfort of it. They speak of it with an air of exaltation. Even the devils, those potent enemies are subject to us. This is not new. Right. This is not new. This is, in other words, what Jesus did, did back then, almost 2,000 years ago, he said, I want to give it to you. He wants to give it to all of us. Even the devils, those potent enemies, are subject to us. Note, the saints have no greater joy or satisfaction in any of their triumphs than in those over Satan. No, 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 they didn't let it go to the head. No, this is, they didn't let it go to the head, but it eventually does. Yes. If devils are subject to us, what can stand before us? Now, in response to what Sister Barney just said, and so we are very careful because, remember, I mentioned Moses Hall. He was the man who was supposed to be speaking against spiritualism, um, coming, trying to attack the church. The prophet tells us the following. She says, those who oppose the teachings of spiritualism are assailing or directing their energies, not, uh, are assailing not men alone, but Satan and his angels. So in other words, we don't go out there in our own strength. And we don't go looking for that type of situation. But God says, I give you power should it come your way. They, you and I, because that includes everyone who is going to be a part of finishing the work, they have entered upon a contest against principalities and powers and wicked spirits in high places. Satan will not yield one inch of ground except as he is driven back by the power of heavenly messengers. The people of God should be able to meet him, as did our Savior with the words, it is written. Thank you, Brother Cavi. Satan can quote scripture now as in the days of Christ and he will pervert its teachings to sustain his delusions. Those who will stand in this time of peril must understand for themselves the testimony of the scriptures. So they went out on this ground. These people went out on this ground. He suddenly went out on this ground and, and Henry tells us, he says, he confirmed what they said. I want you to really ponder on this part right here. He confirmed what they said as agreeing with his own observation. In other words, remember what did Jesus say? He said, I saw, right? I saw Satan, right? So in other words, what Matthew Henry is saying is that Jesus confirms what they said as agreeing with his own observation. My heart and eyes went along with you. I took notice of the success you had and I saw Satan fall as lightning from heaven. So in other words, as they were out, Jesus could see what they were doing and he saw the ground that Satan had been on, they were pushing him back. So Satan was being pushed back by Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. My heart and I went along with you. I took notice of the success you had and I saw Satan falling, fall as lightning from heaven. Note, Satan and his kingdom fell before the preaching of the gospel. I see how it is, saith Christ. As you get ground, the devil loseth ground. Amen. He falls as lightning, falls from heaven so suddenly, so, so irrecoverably, so visibly that all may perceive it and say, see how Satan's kingdom totters? See how it tumbles? They triumphed in casting devils out of the bodies of people, but Christ sees and rejoices in the fall of the devil from the interest he has in the souls of men, which is called his power in high places. God is saying, I want to give you the power. You're going to have to. We're going to have to have the power. You know why? Because the demons are going to be everywhere. And if we're going to be hidden in Christ, then he's got to give us the power because the, the main ones the demons are going to come after are going to be the remnant. The remnant. Remember when, when Jesus steps from between the Father and us and we have to live without an intercessor? 
We got to even, we got to get to that point. We got to get to that point. He foresees this to be an earnest of what should now be shortly done and was already begun. The destroying of Satan's kingdom in the world by the extirpating or removal, the removing of idolatry, idolatry, spiritualism, and the turning of the nations to the faith of Christ. Satan falls from heaven when he falls from the throne in men's hearts. As Christ foresaw that the preaching of the gospel, pardon, as Christ foresaw that the preaching of the gospel, which would fly like lightning through the world, would whatever it would, wherever it went, pull down Satan's kingdom. Now is the prince of this world cast out. So we can see clearly that the Lord has made provisions or is making provisions for us to be able to do this work. But we have to be in position. And those people were in position and Christ said, good job. Here's more. They didn't like, like, like Henry said, they didn't come to Christ complaining. They came to Christ overjoyed, rejoicing. And Christ says, good, here's more. Remember the parable 10, five, one. What happened? Who didn't get any more? The one. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Let's go back. We still have got our books open. So let's look at, let's look at this again. And, and he said unto them, Luke 10, 18 through 20. Luke 10, 18 through 20. I'm in my wrap-up phase. Hard to do. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall be by any means hurt you. Let's see what this means. Let's see how Henry explains this. He says, speaking of, speaking of what Jesus has said in 18 through 20, he says, he repeated, ratified, and enlarged their commission. He said it over again. Authorized and said, you're right. And he gave them more work to do. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents. Note, to him that hath and useth well what he hath more shall be given. They had employed their powers vigorously against Satan, and now Christ entrusts them with greater power, an offensive power, power to tread on serpents and scorpions, devils and malignant spirits, the old serpent. Ye shall bruise their head in my name, according to the first promise found in Genesis 3.15. Come, set your feet on the necks of these enemies, Ye shall tread upon these lions and adders. Wherever you meet with them, you shall trample them under foot. Remember the people said, remember the people said when Jesus, when they saw Jesus doing these things, they said, what new thing, right? They said, what new thing? What new doctrine? But this wasn't new doctrine. This is what the leaders should have heard the people doing long before. And now that Jesus was, for lack of a better, better term, in term, all the demons that were spread all around, they were now coming towards where Jesus was. And remember we talked about his, his fame went throughout all of Samaria, even up into Syria. And the people of Syria were doing what? They were bringing their people down to have Jesus heal them. And so what Jesus is saying is, they don't have to come down to where I am. I'm sending you to where they are. Jesus says, I send them out two by two. And that's what Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to send you and I out two by two. Which takes us to the closing lines of this, the closing few lines of my talk. We know that the people ask Jesus, what shall be the sign of your coming in the, time, in the, time, in the end of time? Jesus tells them all the things that were going to be happening, but he tells them specifically, Sister Cherry, what exactly is going to bring the end to the world. Matthew 24, 14. He says, this is the exact thing. No one knows when it's going to be finished, 
But he says, this is the thing. Because everyone's going to tell you, everyone's going to tell you, Sister Bonnie, no man knoweth the hour or the day. And I say, you are so right. But Jesus says, the event is this one right here. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So as we go on Satan's territory, God is going to give us more power to go further and further into his territory. In fact, think if I just think I'm not right. Maybe he's wrong. But Paul says this. Paul says this. And I got this, this scripture and then revelation and then we're done. Paul says this. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power, right? The power. So in other words, we go out with this power onto not familiar territory, but onto Satan's territory. In other words, wherever we go, it's going to be Satan's territory. Was the church, when Jesus went to preach, when that man with a demonic spirit, was that God's territory or was that Satan's territory? There we have it. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so Matthew 24, as I always, you always hear me tell you, Matthew 24, 14 is Jesus saying, this is when it's going to be finished. Romans 1, 16 and 17 tells us that it has power. And our final, our final verses will be found in the three angels message. Revelation 14, 6 through 12. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. That means, remember, the enemy is the prince of the air. He is the prince of this kingdom, right? Right? Yeah. So in other words, the giving of the first, second, and third angel's message was Raymond, okay? The giving of the first, second, and third angel's message means we're going on to territory that's, that, that, that Satan has authority over, yeah. right? So in other words, those who give the three angels message will have power. Now, the first time it was given, they didn't quite understand. But we're told that the second time that it's going to be given, it will get power from the angel of Revelation 18, and the earth shall be lighted with his glory. We will be casting out demons in his name. To every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains and water. And there followed another, they follow another angel saying what? And here it is. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. The Babylon is the cage, what? Of every unclean and hateful bird. So by the time we get to where we are now, this, this world has spiritualism everywhere. The power that was needed the first time or the power that was used the first time, if we look at that verse again, it says, and there followed another angel, but that angel is not as powerful as the first and the third angel. But when the angel of Revelation 18 comes, all three of them get more power. Get more power. And the reason why, I wish I had more time, but I said I was going to, I said I was going to cut it short. The reason why this angel in Revelation 18 comes and gives more power according to what the pioneers wrote it's because by the time that we get to the end spiritualism will be up here and you will need we will need more power to counter the work of spiritualism and so when we look at the first giving of the first three angels messages remember 1843 and 1844 right right but the Fox sisters didn't do what they had to do until when? 1848. So spiritualism hadn't started manifesting itself as profoundly in the United States until 1848. So when the giving of the first and second angel's message was given, spiritualism wasn't, wasn't going anywhere. It hadn't risen yet. But then in 1848, it comes on the scene. And so now the power, which is 
after 1848 that is needed needs to come from the angel of Revelation 18, 1 through 4. And that's the angel that the earth is lighted with his glory. Amen. And so, so now we're in the time when spiritualism is at its height. And remember, we know it's true because all you got to do is look at what the leaders do and look at what the people do. And you ultimately have to say, I've never seen a time like this before. Everybody wants to fight war. You even heard, I even heard the president say, we're the USA. We can fight two wars. Really? So let's continue. Let's finish it up. And the third angel. Well, let's go back to the second angel. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen. That great city because she made all nations and people drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What is wine? Doctrine. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark where? In his forehead. That's where we make our decisions. Or in his hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture in, 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 this, in this nation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. I'll stop right there. I'll stop right there. The reason why this third angel's message is so profound, the reason why it's so profound is because God is saying, I've sent every measure that I possibly can to save you. I sent the prophets. I sent, and you killed them. I sent my son, and you killed him. I sent messages after messages, even after that. And you spurned the messages. Remember, we said paganism persecuted the Jews. The beast persecuted the Christians. And now we see that the false prophet will persecute the remnant church. And, and, Christ, and God says, no, it's not going there. You're not going that far. He says, I've tried everything I possibly can. That's why the first angel says, fear God. Because at the time of the giving of the first angel's message, the Protestant churches were not fearing God. They were fearing the God of the first day of the week. And so God says, I send a message so you'll know that it's not the first day of the week. It's the Sabbath. And they still reject it. So God says, I've given you everything. And look how much time he's allowed to linger. So that's why the cup of his indignation is going to be so wicked. Because God says, I've tried every single thing. And now all you can get is the cup of my indignation. No, there is going to be no mixture in that wrath. That wrath will have no mercy in it whatsoever. Because the people who receive that wrath will be filled with devils. They will be filled with devils. So it's incumbent upon us, brothers and sisters, to fill ourselves up with this truth so that when the time for the Lord to have us to come out, because whatever is in us is what's going to come out. If the angels withdraw their, I mean, if the Holy Spirit withdraws its control, whatever is inside of us is going to come out. So we need to put in check what's inside of us. Amen? And so... The third angel, we are told, I'm done, Brother Raymond. I'm done. Don't worry. <laughs> I wanted to share this last line, and I think I may have lost it. Don't worry about it. If I don't, don't worry. It's next, we have next time. So since that, thus the message of the third angel will be proclaimed as the time comes for it to be given with greatest power. The Lord will work through humble instruments leading the minds of those who consecrate themselves to his service. The laborers will be qualified rather by the unction of his spirit than by the training of literary institutions. Men of faith and prayer will be constrained to go forth with holy zeal, declaring the words which God gives them. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observation of the church by civil authority, the inroads of what? Spiritualism. See, our work is to, un to unmask spiritualism as well. The stealthy but rapid progress of the papal power all will be unmasked by you and I. By these solemn warnings, the people will be stirred. Are you ready to stir up some people? You ready to stir up some people? It's time for us to stir up some people. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. But as for me and my house, beloved, 
we will serve the Lord. Amen. Let's close out. Most kind and most gracious and most wonderful Father, we know your patience is been, has been tested and is being tested by your people. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to see ourselves in the light of the cross and in your word, your the commandments. Help us, Father, to decrease that Christ may increase that our steps may be ordered in your word and that we truly will fulfill the role of the third Elijah's that we may come back to you, that we may come to you and said, Lord, even the, the, the devils are subject to us and your name. And Lord, as you expand our work, help us to be humble, to know that even though you're working through us, it is you that's worketh in us both to will and to do of your good pleasure. And we'll be careful to give your name praise, honor, and glory. We thank you for choosing us first and all that you've done for us, Lord. This is our prayer we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. If you would like to support the Second Advent Messenger Ministries, you may do so by going to www.thesecondadventmessenger.org and go to the donate page. You may also donate through PayPal or through Zelly. We thank you for your support. God bless.